First of all, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like you, uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to tonight's event on world politics and coronavirus. Um, as we all observe, the world is uh, going through difficult days in the last few months because of the pandemic. And uh, the number of those who have been infected with the virus has exceeded 2 million people globally. Um, definitely the immediate and most important effect of the virus is on the health of individuals and millions of people. Nevertheless, um, directly or indirectly, uh, the pandemic has consequences for uh, various aspects of life, uh, such as economics, politics, diplomacy. Uh, so today, this event will focus on the effects of coronavirus on politics and international relations, mainly. Um, we have distinguished speakers, the faculty members of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Ibn Haldun University. Um, I would like to welcome them as well, uh, Professor Talha Köse, Eric Ringmar, Ibar Rauf, and Wahabuddin Reis. Um, our panelists uh, will discuss different aspects of this situation get, uh, that we are going through. Um, each speaker will have five to six minutes of talk. So they are, they, these are like brief talks on specific questions. Um, and then we will have an open forum and Q&A session. Uh, before we get started, I would like to ask everybody to use the chat section on Zoom uh, to write their questions directly to me so that I can uh, refer them to our panelists at the end of their talks. So um, I would like to begin with uh, Dr. Talha Köse. Um, Talha Hocam, many experts of international relations make certain predictions about possible impacts of the uh, virus on international security. Um, do you think it is an overreaction? Uh, will the pandemic have an influence on international peace and security? Um, and what will be the consequences globally as well as regionally? Uh, what do you think about uh, this question? Uh, I would like to thank uh, our department for organizing this event. Uh, we have read lots of uh, reviews, lots of comments on, the, uh, on this problem. So some of them are really quite pessimistic and we will you know, never turn back to the life we got used to. Uh, I think we have to recognize that uh, this is a huge drastic change uh, in world politics, uh, world history. So it's a significant event. And uh, we have to also recognize the fact that uh, there are lots of uncertainties, uh, lots of you know, changes. Uh, and uh, you know, those uncertainties and changes, if they are properly managed, uh, can uh, be, uh, you know, can reduce the risk of the conflict. And if they are not managed well, I think this may turn into a huge chaotic situation. So I see in the both side of the uh, situation, I think the management of the crisis is very important and I don't see any kind of uh, cooperation and un uh, common understanding, shared understanding on this. However, the main impact of this uh, coronavirus crisis, I think is it will uh, accelerate the change rather than creating a complete new situation there are already certain trends in world history and world politics. For instance, there is a power transition from West Europe, uh, you know, America to Asia. So I think this process is likely to accelerate this power transition. Secondly, there's an increasing in gap and inequality, especially in the Western countries and the rest of the world. I think this crisis will also increase uh, the further um, uh, increase this income gap and inequality. Also, there was uh, a decline in the trust in the institutions, international institutions and domestic institutions. So for instance, United Nations, European uh, Union and uh, World Health Organization, World Trade, Trade Organization and domestically the, uh, the institutions that were supposed to do the you know, health issues, uh, education, so I think this process, this uh, you know, coronavirus will also increase uh, the decline in the trust in the institutions. There is also, uh, in connection with the income inequality and you know gap, 
there was also polarization between different segments of the societies. So from ethnic, sectarian, and even the class level polarization. I think this crisis, although it's a shared crisis, but the response to this crisis uh, probably may accelerate the polarization. So lots of people, lots of all segments of the societies will be influenced. However, the response will be different. There is also, uh, especially in the West, aging, uh, you know, problem of aging and insufficient services. And this problem uh, and also declining uh, competitiveness in the West. So I think this problem will also increase the impact of, uh, you know, uh, aging uh, and they will, this will probably make them less competitive internationally in terms of trade. Uh, uh, so uh, these are uh, significant problems. And uh, I think most important thing, uh, if you look at the conflicts in the post World War II period, starting from the 1945, most of the conflicts happened in the periphery. So although there was a Cold War system, uh, some kind of uh, stability, most uh, violent conflicts happened uh, in the peripheries, in Africa, in the Middle East, in other parts, uh, and there were proxy conflicts. So it is likely that with this uh, transformation, uh, the Europe, the center of the world economy and politics may also face uh, real conflicts, real violent conflicts. The other thing is that uh, I think the increasing uh, complexity uh, and uh, the multi-layer aspect of this uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, uh, crisis is threatening, and uh, I think there's a huge problem there. So there's economic aspect, increasing uh, unemployment, increasing, uh, you know, decline in productivity, decline in world trade. So this will, uh, I think, affect uh, eventually the political aspect, and this will also eventually. Uh, polarize the people all over the world. So the, the culturally, economically, it's a very complicated uh, conflict. Uh, unlike the, uh, the previous uh, conflicts or previous crises we have experienced uh, in the uh, post-World War uh, II uh, era. So there is also uh, different, uh, you know, industries, individuals, uh, the companies and states will be affected. So in that sense, it's a multi-layer issue. So. Uh, the other thing is that the, the world powers, especially Europe, US, are not prepared to handle this crisis. That's what we see. So they were much vulnerable to this issue in terms of health, in terms of uh, employment. I think that was a very important uh, transformation. That was important change in the minds of the people. So they will recognize that we are not as powerful as they seem. And also, uh, the, the basis of the stability, especially in the uh, global West, and uh, the, was that uh, there was a consensus between the states, uh, people, societies, and the markets. I think this consensus will be affected very negatively, so which will make everything much more complicated. So this, at least at the center, there was some consensus. I think this. A coronavirus situation will accelerate the decline of this consensus. What is making this problem even more difficult to handle? So uh, the sources of pessimism is that, you know, there is a, a decline of uh, cooperation between international actors. There is decline of uh, leadership. So as you see uh, in 2008 global financial crisis, there was leadership in the US, in Germany take uh, important roles. We don't see similar role in, uh, you know, uh, Trump administration. They focus on America. In Europe, we see lack of leadership, and there is also leadership problem in China. That it's uh, a question. So uh, I think there is also decline in the trust uh, in international institutions, which are regulating bodies of the conflicts. So international trade also reduces the conflicts. So. Uh, with this transformation, with the coronavirus, I think there will be uh, a decline in uh, international trade, which also will impact reducing, uh, conflict reducing impact uh, of the uh, trade. I think that's uh, also a significant uh, issue. And, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, transformation also, uh, uh, there is a changing, shifting, uh, power balance between, so as we say it from West to, uh, you know, uh, Asia, 
this will also affect, it usually creates, generates the conflict. So if you look at the picture, there is a period of uncertainty and change. And the coronavirus crisis will accelerate this, this change. And we don't really have sufficient mechanisms, institutions to address this problem. This is the huge change. And also uh, shifting the conflict and tensions from periphery to center. I think this is the major change. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Tala Hocam. These are really important points. Uh, but I don't know um, whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic about because the picture you uh, draw uh, includes like no cooperation, no leadership, decline of consensus, increase of inequality. These are also, I mean, the things we may uh, say when we talk about uh, a, a global political and economic crisis, right? I mean, these are the features almost yes. or the preconditions for such a crisis. So I, as far as I understood, you are predicting not a really optimistic scenario about upcoming years. Is that correct? Well, I mean, uh, I give two examples. I mean, two major crises uh, of the post-World War II. So 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge systemic crisis and also a 2008 financial crisis. So one of them is managed really terribly. So the global war on terror was mistaken. There was no consensus and the wrong targets. No, yeah. So uh, this uh, cooperation, common understanding had, uh, you know, ended very easily and it left behind a huge uh, mess. Whereas in 2008 uh, global financial crisis, the G20 mechanisms, uh, you know, the cooperation between international actors and common understanding and shared interest. I think there is a, a good uh, crisis management. So it was a systemic crisis, not like this one. I mean, it was much smaller in terms of its content because right now it is much more complicated, but uh, at least there was some kind of uh, cooperation and common understanding, which gives us a hope. So uh, I think any crisis can be managed. We cannot go back to uh, pre-coronavirus period, uh, but the post-coronavirus period can be managed uh, in a better way or there may be fragmentation in all aspects. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Talha Hocam. Um, okay. I, will, I would like to continue with Professor Eric Ringmar. Um, Eric Hocam, one of the discussions um, around the pandemic is about its effects on globalization. So when faced with a risk to the health and security of their nations, the states are taking some precautions to deal with the disease, but this may lead to a new phase of isolation, some commentators say. Um, the flow of goods and humans has decreased considerably uh, globally in the last uh, few months. Uh, many airlines stop uh, lots of their flights so are we at the end of the era of free flow of goods, services, and individuals as globalization is defined? Um, is there a future for globalization um, after the pandemic? What do you think? <laughs> okay. Um, I have a hard time talking about the future, really. <clears throat> I don't have so much to say about the future. I just don't know. But I... When I'm faced with questions like this, I usually try to look back into history and try to draw parallels. And in that way, perhaps you can learn something. So the way I think about globalization, um, as, as many others do too, of course, is in terms of exchange. So it's about economic markets, it's about trade of goods and services, but also, of course, many other things, ideas, projects, religion, culture, hopes, dreams, we're, we're exchanging things on a global level. And this has tremendous impact. And there are three examples of this. The first one I would like to mention goes all the way back to the 13th and 14th centuries. This is the time of the Mongol, Mongol Empire. And the Mongol Empire, uh, very few, a million people maybe in Mongolia, and they managed to connect by means of a very elaborate road network. They can connect China and India, the Middle East and Europe. And this is how incredible Chinese inventions travel, 
compasses, printing presses, paper making, gunpowder, many, many other things. And they hook up with Indian culture and we get all these things from India, Indian mathematics and Muslim culture, and then with to Europe. So everyone benefits greatly from this. The other example is from, well, 1492 really, um, the European connection with, with America. And you talk about the Colombian exchange. The Colombian exchange, of course, having to do with Columbus, right? Christopher Columbus. But it refers to the exchange of plants and animals that um, take place between the new world and the old world. So we are getting potatoes, we're getting tomatoes. Can you imagine in Italy they had no tomatoes before 1492? In India they had no chilies, they couldn't make a proper curry. We had no chocolate. And of course we give to them, we give horses and cows and goats and, sh and sheep and, and coffee to Brazil, right? Brazilian gets coffee. The third example is what's happening now. This is the industrial era. And especially, of course, the last 30 years, when in living standards have increased dramatically. And hundreds of millions of people have been taken out of poverty. And people who used to be desperately poor suddenly are having pretty decent lives. And this is all because of free trade, the global market. So I think globalization is great. I'm a great fan. I'm a great fan of exchange. Exchange allows you to leave your own little societies and to learn from other societies. You can broaden your horizons. You can escape your prejudices. You can get away from your set ways of thinking. Maybe it's because I'm from a stupid little country myself. Only a few million people, very kind of closed off culture, very narrow minded people. You grow as you leave this culture and you get into contact with with other people, you, you develop your human potential. But it's not just products and ideas that we exchange, right? We exchange germs and viruses as well. And think about the Mongol Empire. We had the Black Death, we had the bubonic plague. They spread along the trade routes connecting China and, and India and Middle East and Europe. And something like maybe a third of the population died half of the population died. There was widespread death in China, Middle East, and in Europe. And then after Columbus, the Colombian exchange, it was not just plants and, and animals. It was also viruses and disease. So something like maybe 80% of the population of North America died because of smallpox and measles. 80%, unbelievable. And now, of course, we have the coronavirus, right? Today, we have a lot more knowledge, of course, and maybe coronavirus is not as lethal as these previous illnesses, but still, I mean, we're in a position when millions and millions of people can die. So today we're in a situation where there's only a very partial exchange. I mean, we're all exchanging on the internet so much, right? Um, this exchange is taking place there, but at the same time, we can't leave our buildings. We can't leave our houses. It's only very essential trade only. We're all locked up. We're stuck in our little worlds. It's a very strange thing for me as a foreigner in Turkey. I don't even know where I am. In what sense am I in Turkey? I mean, it's very unclear. Where am I? It's, I, I just don't know. One problem I see here is that our version of the global market has focused very much on economic rationality, on what's profitable, and there's very little redundancy built into the system. We have no margins. For example, the, in the US, or everywhere in the Western world, there, there's no testing capacity. There are no hospital beds. There's nothing in addition to what's usually needed. So we have responded by providing resources that are enough to be economically rational, but not more. We, we only look at what can be justified in economic terms. And that's clearly not good enough. So we must do things somehow in a different way. And the question is how to do that. And it seems to me that what we need to do really is to look more at our own traditions, the traditions of our societies. And traditions are often very difficult to understand because 
often they just don't make sense. There's, there's a lot of old traditions and we're looking at these things and we're saying, what is this? Who cares about this? We don't know what this is. But very often traditions are, I would say smarter than individuals. And the reason is that individuals, each one of us, we only know about our little world. And we don't know about what has been before, what has happened before. And we don't know about the future. But the traditions do, because the traditions have been around for a long, long time. And in a way, the traditions are more intelligent than we are as individuals. And I'll give you two examples of this, and then I'll stop. First one is a little bit, um, the smaller example, let's say, and the other example is a little bit bigger. Now, in Denmark, a few years ago, they banned the um, wearing of burka. It's illegal for women in Denmark to wear a burka in public. And of course, today that makes no sense, right? Because everyone in Denmark is wearing face covering. So it seems to me that somehow the tradition knew something that individual lawmakers in Denmark didn't know. Muslim countries have gone through pandemics for, for hundreds of years. And somehow you can imagine that this is represented in the, in the dress code. So a Danish person a few years ago would look at a burqa wearing, wearing Muslim woman and would say, oh, that's so strange. Why do they look like that? And why do they wear those kind of clothes? And, and today, you know why they wear those kind of clothes, because you are wearing the same kind of clothes yourself. So the tradition is more intelligent than, than our, our, us individuals today. The other example has to do with neoliberalism and individualism. So we're relying on markets for everything. Everything in our societies has a price, but nothing really has a value. And we're thinking only about ourselves. Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, British Prime Minister, she said, there is no such thing as a society. There are only individuals. So society has been very difficult to defend. And in a way, what, what is society, right? You look for society, where is it? All I see are a lot of individuals. Perhaps Thatcher was right. Perhaps there is no society. No, tradition tells us there is a society. There's always been a society. And society is right here. We see it before our, ourselves today, right? Um, because there is no individual solution to the pandemic. All the solutions to the pandemic presuppose that we work together because viruses are contagious. There's no vaccine and there's no medicine. You can't help yourself. We have to help each other. And we do this by staying at home, by looking after our, our selves, and also by protecting others when we go outside. There's no other way. Not even the richest person can protect him, him or herself. There is no protection, except the protection that we engage in together. So what is this? It's society. It's right here. It's right before us. And I think this is very problematic, for example, in the US, where people still to this day are insisting on what they call their individual rights. And they're saying that individual rights are more important than society. And I think this is just wrong. They are just wrong. Society is more important than the individual. And this is proven by the fact that this is our only way to protect ourselves, to be together and to save each other. So what I can see is we have to restart the exchange. The exchange is extremely important. We can't lock ourselves into our little worlds, but we must also become a lot smarter about the way we exchange. We must listen to our traditions and the traditions is where we can get, we can get good advice. Our traditions can protect us maybe actually even from viruses, you know? We all dress up in burqa and we'll be much better off. This, if they provide, it's all about cloth, right? Cloth covering. And I think it can also protect us from things like neoliberalism and individualism because those were terrible mistakes that mankind cannot afford. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric Ojan. 
in a time when um, all political scientists and international relations experts are talking about the future of pandemic, <laughs> um, I think it was um, very useful to remind us the, the history of pandemic and the past experiences. Um, and when you were talking about that the, uh, the current capitalist society is very much relying on small margins on the market, uh, this was also uh, reminded me that um, one of the claims of modern capitalism is that it solved the scarcity problem in, 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 in economies. Uh, but on the one hand, it has the capacity to solve scarcity problems. On the other, since it was not economically rational to provide all of the things that you can produce, you do not produce or you do not sell, so that we just live on the margins, uh, on small margins. And um, finally, I, I, uh, I very much, uh, I, I think, I mean, your emphasis on uh, the, the, the relation between traditional uh, ways of living and the, the claim of modern men uh, about, and women, of course, about um, the, the way they should live in is very, very useful. Uh, we need to keep these in mind and we will, I think, come to back to this in our Q&A session. Um, thanks a lot again. Thank you, thank you. So um, I would like to continue with um, Dr. Hibarov um, and with another aspect of the crisis. Uh, Hibarov, um, I think another aspect of the pandemic is about the state capacities and state responses. So as one of the classical definitions of the state is related to their war making capacity. Um, so what is the relation you think between war, state, the war on virus? Um, so did a virus disarm the states? What do you think? Well, I, <clears throat> I've been following the news and I've been trying to uh, figure out where we are heading. And of course, uh, we have different approaches and different imaginations. I mean, the imagination of a political theorist is different from someone who is uh, a strategist, uh, from someone who is uh, an international relations expert. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming from the political theory background and I always uh, watch the state very carefully, how states react, how states respond to challenges in a way. And uh, for the last few weeks, actually, I have noticed some uh, some things, so I'm not uh, like predicting or giving uh, giving uh, concrete scenarios for the future. I'm just trying to share what I have noticed so far. Uh, of course, we know that the sovereignty is very much based on the notion of protect protection of the uh, of the territory. So sovereignty and territoriality are very much linked to each other, but also capitalism and uh, uh, and temporality are linked to each other because time. Uh, is basically colonialized. It's basically distributed along the lines of production, uh, and people uh, are convinced that uh, that uh, uh, the, the sphere where they are working and and producing uh, is limited to specific times, etc. Uh, many things have changed since the pandemic started, and we had to turn to experts. Uh, not in this case the politicians, not even uh, academics like ourselves. Everyone is uh, uh, turning his his face to the doctors, basically. Uh, looking at the the, the WHO uh, head that became much more important than the head of the UN, you know, so Secretary General of the UN. Everyone is following the, the statistics uh, all day long, uh, in which country, what, what happened, the, 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 the rise and, and the curve and flattening the curve and herds immunity and all these new terms that we didn't know before or were not uh, very familiar with. So I think that uh, what we are facing now, right from the outstart, was a very, uh, very uh, straightforward challenge to the ability of the state to promote its, its, its basic role to protect. Because when you have a concrete enemy, then you can launch wars. You can accuse your even enemies if they are like uh, uh, militias or ISIS or even uh, uh, political opposition sometimes in the third world country of being terrorists, you know, of being a threat. And you can legitimize acting accordingly 
using and launching wars and using military uh, uh, tactics. But uh, what are you going to do in a war on the virus? I mean, so this is this is a new situation where people feel extremely uh, afraid, extremely vulnerable, and the state as a state, what would it do? I mean, if you bring the army to the streets to maintain order, it will not actually affect very much the the the, the pandemic's uh, uh, threat. So here here is a dilemma. The people wake up in the morning and realize that no matter how powerful you are, like the United States, for example, if you don't have a very strong health uh, system, if you don't have policies, basically, uh, that protect people, if you don't have policies of education that have been preparing people uh, and have been preparing systems for the shift towards uh, 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 online teaching, for example, you, 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 you basically are facing dilemmas. And having such a great army will not help you much. Of course, it will help you on other sides, but not in this situation. So I think that uh, the first few weeks we witnessed that uh, the doctors stand in front of presidents, stand in front of leaders in the different uh, 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 press uh, conferences and, and statements uh, addressed to the nation, etc. Doctors were there all the time. Everyone is addressing them. Two things happened actually in the second month of the pandemic, which is that uh, presidents are trying to show again, uh, to show up on the scene again, and to confirm that they are going to fight the virus, we're going to win over the threat, you know, as if they are facing a direct enemy that I, everyone can see, because they realize that if they give in to the experts, if they give in to different sectors in society, like scientists, for example, it would basically undermine the grip of the, polit the political uh, on the minds of people. A second thing is that actually uh, there is so much going on, though people have to stay at home uh, in terms of civil society, donations, attempts to uh, even let the copyrights open and, uh, and, the, and the protocols and the uh, production uh, uh, sort of uh, procedures open to everyone. A big company uh, uh, that is responsible for producing ventilators open the, the technology that it has to everyone to uh, copy and imitate and, and reproduce uh, in their own respective countries because, I mean, if the world is over, nobody will benefit. The market will fall anyway. Uh, and, and, other, and others uh, made the, the technology of the 3D uh, printing for, uh, for masks also available. So you witness also a reaction of civil society and global civil society in, in return. But also, on the other hand, you'll find that uh, now there is a, a militarization of the discourse uh, regarding the virus. You're talking about war on the virus. This is a war we'll, we will win. We will win over the virus. I mean, you'll find it in different uh, uh, media outlets and platforms. So this is very striking. Can, can armies win a war on the virus? This is, this is a thing that we have to think about. And I think that it would result eventually which might be good news for some nations, uh, it will be a must basically to direct a lot of uh, funding to uh, uh, scientific research, to education, to uh, national health uh, uh, systems, uh, because it's, it's very obvious what happened. Obama tried to push a bit towards this direction. Trump came and completely spoiled the whole thing. And now he's saying, I mean, five years ago, nobody could have anticipated. Actually, Obama anticipated, and he said it, and others like, uh, uh, like uh, Bill Gates anticipated, and many, many warnings were there, but nobody listens because the search for power, the search for monopoly, the search for the boosting of sovereignty and expanding uh, your influence uh, uh, globally was taking priority. And I think that, that this war, uh, against the virus will actually have a, a lot of implications on redefining war and redefining sovereignty. Uh, we have now three emerging spheres that are very important to follow. Uh, and I'm trying to follow them as much as I can. First is the virus sphere. Uh, we go to different uh, uh, readings now uh, and books and sometimes I ask my students to give, uh, give a, uh, have a look at such writings uh, written basically by doctors or by uh, hygiene uh, uh, experts. Uh, I can give the example of two books. One book is titled The Virus Sphere, and another, uh, The Rules of the Con uh, Contagion, uh, Why Things Spread and Why They Stop. This was published 2020, so probably at the very beginning of the pandemic, someone uh, made the effort to sit and, and write something about 
how things spread and not only what spreads is virus, but also panic, fear, uh, uh, different attitudes in, in society, consumerism, uh, this consumerism of fear, people running to grab things because they don't know uh, whether there will be a lockdown and they can uh, uh, find what they need uh, in their, in their uh, uh, kitchens and, and fridges, etc. So this is the virus fear and its impact on, on markets. But also we have the biosphere, uh, the state when it tells people by law in all the countries, it, it, it managed to, of course, this is essential to fight the virus, but at the, at the same time, it's also very much related to the sovereignty of the state. This biopolitical approach to, uh, to the new situation that you have to stay at home. And uh, I was reminded by the discourse of many governments, especially in, in the Middle East and in the third world, accusing those who go out because they cannot afford to stay at home of being basically uh, 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 ignorant, of being uncivil, of being savage, you know, as if, if you break the law, it's not about that. It's about you did not provide those people with the necessary means to survive during the lockdown. And they have to go out and find a way to feed their families. And of course, the more you go to the south, in the south sphere of the world, the more this is an issue. So I've been also following the discourse, accusing those who do not have, by those who do have, you know, of being ignorant and savage and going out and you're going to make things even worse regarding the virus and the pandemic. Okay, where were your economic uh, uh, just uh, and egalitarian policies to uh, prepare for such a moment that have been anticipated actually by scientists, by uh, by some decision makers, even uh, by by historians, nobody listened to historians. Uh, you know, when they said that germs and and weapons, uh, the changes and shifts in the in the invention and in the in the knowledge can actually affect uh, our history and and can make a change. Uh, so the virus sphere, the biosphere, and of course, a lot of philosophy has been also. Uh, uh, showing on the scene, Agamben wrote something, others replied, uh, Cicek, uh, Cicek uh, 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 replied, you know, we have also a philosophical debate regarding uh, the state of exception, how far the states will benefit from that to basically control people more by making them sit in their homes for longer time to make other arrangements. Of course, if you ask someone to go now for a demonstration asking for more human rights, more uh, uh, democracy in any country, uh, this is not a priority anymore. So this is this is like a good moment for people to hold governments accountable, but also for governments to get away with so many things under the, under this state of exception. So the war on the virus can have the same outcomes or impacts like the war on terrorism, because it can be used basically by states to enlarge their hegemony over uh, the people. Uh, the third sphere is actually the ecosphere. It, it will not be a, a trivial matter when we, inshallah, yani come out of that uh, crisis, uh, the whole of humanity, that people more and more will realize that the ecosphere is very important and that the environmental, environmental issues are actually important as well. Uh, so the, the, the virus sphere and the ecosphere will, will gain more uh, interest uh, by a majority of people. Of course, when we talk about the lockdown, we also are talking about or the quarantine or whatever you call it, we're also talking about urban spaces. And this reminds me of uh, Zygmunt Bauman's work uh, and Saskia Sassen and others, sociologists, uh, regarding urban wars. So how is the city going to be reshaped? The city witnessed in the last decades militarization. You know, so we have cities under siege, we have uh, cities, the rebel cities, you know, and all these are names of uh, academic works by different uh, sociologists and uh, urban, uh, uh, urban sociologists. So uh, watch the urban because the urban will be the theater, the platform for a lot of changes in the coming, uh, in the coming months. And depending on how far the government can control uh, and, and win in these urban wars, uh, will affect uh, definitely all the struggles for justice and equality uh, on the long term. Uh, we, when we teach uh, 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 theory of the state, we start with the formation of the state. And we remember uh, the work of uh, Charles Tilly when he said uh, that uh, uh, the state making is actually organized crime. Uh, and, and he has a very interesting theory on that because it entails a lot of violence to establish a state. But it also entails a lot of violence to continue. 
and uh, armies have been sort of trying to move uh, in that direction. We are not uh, we are not forgetting that the NATO has got its own also scientific and research arm. Uh, so it's not only uh, about the military alliances. Uh, it's also about research. It's also about uh, promoting specific ideas and uh, and reaching out to academics. So uh, how how the war would would shift how how the military tactics how the language of mil the militarization of language we are we are all soldiers for the sake of the country even in in a case uh, that is very interesting and close to uh, to me when I, because I'm following closely in Egypt now they call the doctors the white army so it's like why should we call the doctors the white army I mean <laughs> and why militarize the language of of how to fight a virus and make the military present in everything that we do. So uh, also how we describe, and this panic and its, uh, its outcomes. Uh, I think that this, this, uh, 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 this uh, situation of spreading fear uh, and, and uh, trying to control and trying to, con to make use of the sovereignty as a shield and protector uh, will witness substan substantial uh, qualitative changes, and it's not just business as usual for sovereignty, the state and the armies. I think that we have to keep a close uh, look at what is going on now because it will have an impact on how people need to think in the future about uh, uh, political uh, dissent, about the struggles, uh, whether in the economic or the socioeconomic uh, uh, spheres, and, uh, and how armies actually, and this is my fear, that the armies will invent new wars in order to prove that they have a role to play, and hence keep dominating and keep getting from the uh, from the from the budget of the of the state the the, the share that is uh, completely uh, obscure uh, for accountability and transparency. So I think that uh, approaching the the pandemic situation globally from the approach of war as a war. Uh, will highlight some of the of the challenges we are facing now uh, regarding uh, human will, human freedom, let alone the technosphere, which is the fourth sphere, uh, which is uh, not only about uh, violating privacy of people and collecting information, uh, trying to find out your location so that you can be controlled and we can control the spread of the pandemic by uh, knowing uh, who you contacted with if you if you are testing positive. But also uh, uh, data mining, uh, our, our Zoom itself has been uh, in, in some instances uh, hacked and, and uh, penetrated. And uh, there is evidence that uh, some of our data has been leaking to China. Uh, and while uh, uh, Macron uh, uh, came out uh, uh, two days ago calling for international, uh, for international truce, for global truce, to stop wars and to stop violence and to give, uh, to give opportunity for, for governments to deal with the matter of the pandemic. Uh, some of the, uh, of the voices in the United States actually were calling for more armament in the Pacific against China. So as a war globally, war as a discourse and as a, as a paradigm for the state inside, I think is one of the aspects that should be uh, noticed and looked at uh, uh, during this crisis. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much, Ibarja. Uh Really insightful comments from a political theory perspective. Um, I think we will deal with uh, the points you touch upon more in Q&A session. Uh, but the last sentences you mentioned is a good uh, connection with our next speaker. Uh, Professor Wahabuddin Reis. Um, Wahabuddin Hocam, Hiba Hoca ended his talk with um, the comments on uh, the, the power transition or the rivalry between uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia and, 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 and the West. So my question is, will the pandemic affect great power politics? So while the problem seems primarily related to health, um, the world leaders are associating the virus predominantly with China. Um, Trump um, is uh, using re repeatedly the phrase Chinese virus, virus to refer to Corona, for example. Uh, similarly, other leaders uh, said Chinese government concealed information, thus misled the world. Um, even some said that uh, the Chinese should pay the price 
So how will the pandemic shape great power politics? Uh, what do you think? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, when we look at these type of events that are happening in, in the international system, uh, we need to look at actually uh, the nature of the international system. And we need to look at the issues of cooperation and stability uh, from the context and vantage point view of uh, uh, great power relationship. In other words, anything happens in the world. It is not the making of small countries or 200 countries, they come together and they will be sitting together and in the United Nation or somewhere in the sitting. But it's actually those very few states which are very powerful, what we call them great powers. These are the ones that who uh, basically make, make the, the, the decisions in the development, in the creation, in the ordering, in the management of uh, uh, a specific international scenario and is international happening. Uh, like the what what happened the the, the corona, but let let me uh, just check. Um, I mean, take you back to the days before corona, or maybe even uh, until today, and uh, the, the currently, um, what type of uh, international system uh, that existed, uh, which will define the connection between the the. Um, the states who are basically considered to be the stakeholder. Um, is it an international system that existed where that all these uh, uh, states, which we call them great powers like China, Russia, for that matter, uh, France or Britain or Germany and the United States, uh, basically are, are, it is something that they were all sharing this cake and it is the, something made by all of them, or it is actually uh, the making of one and the others are basically the beneficiary. And therefore, uh, if you look at the history of this, uh, the very short history, maybe if you just put a you know, glance through, uh, maybe from even World War II onward, it is, it is, or maybe from World War I to World War II, it is a system which basically, uh, I think it is mainly argued that that is the uh, system uh, which was created uh, by the, the West and led by the, the United States. So in a way, um, one would, would assume and one would, would believe that this is an, a system which is basically created by the, uh, the Americans. It's an American dominated system uh, where Joseph Nye calls this system uh, a kind of liberal uh, international order, uh, international system. Now, in this system, if you look at the, all the institutions, the structures, economic, political, um, social, whatever it is, then it is created by uh, the, the, the one who have manufactured it. So the manufacturers, the United States and the United States have created it. Uh, from, from IMF to World Bank to United Nations to human rights and to, uh, so in, every, in everything the United States for right reason or wrong reasons was, was dominant. And most of the time, certain good things in this system have been used in order to promote the American um, agenda. Uh, so therefore, uh, it, it is a system, it was a system uh, which is basically created by the, the US and US is basically um, claiming a credit for this. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about the American system. I'm not talking basically about one administration in, 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 in the US and that administration, which is the current administration of President Trump. So President Trump is one thing, but to say the American um, agenda is a different, whether it is a Democrat or it is Republican. So in the middle of these um, Republicans, you get one person, a businessman who tries to dismantle everything for his own purpose and try to promote his business in a way. That is how uh, the, the, the Trump administration is accused. Now, you have a system uh, which you will find um, dominated by the US. And US always has tried to uh, find who challenges this system. Um, in other words, if you want to see who are the adversaries to this system, who would uh, plan for destruction of this system. 
you would find immediately you, you will find the Soviet Union, later you would find um, terrorism, Islamic fundamentalism, um, and uh, you, you, you would find its latest version was uh, China. So you're having, uh, China is now coming up to, and then you have uh, the, the post-Soviet Russia. So you, you, you're seeing that these are the ones uh, for one reason or the other reason the United States would ensure that uh, uh, therefore uh, is, is my system and these are the threat. Now, in order to say that, that this system is being transformed or in other words, any, any one of these powers uh, whether ideologically, whether politically, whether militarily or economically, uh, they must move into the, to the center. And moving to the center means they should be able to really uh, control and have control over those uh, structures and institutional basis of the, the international system. So if we are going to, uh, to say uh, China, Russia for that matter, or someone else is uh, replacing, the United States, then we should look at it in terms of uh, the abilities um, uh, in terms of controlling and having a greater influence in the uh, institutional basis of, uh, of, of the international system. It is like two political parties, they're, 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 they're running for elections and both of them say I'm, I'm victorious, but one of them is having control over the state institutions of the judiciary, executive legislature. Uh, then the other one is outside. Uh, so which one is more powerful? The one who is really controlling the institutions. The same thing, anyone who is in, you know, that in the driving seat of this institution uh, then will be the dominant, uh, the dominant uh, player. Uh, would anyone else will replace it? There will be challengers, yes. The challenges would be, would be getting greater, would be bigger, and, and sometimes challenges will be uh, suppressed, but challenges would always be there and it will be watchful of those challenges. So now you have a system in which the United States is basically is dominating and the United States is controlling and the United States is reinventing and the United States had uh, and basically is comparatively uh, to, to, to speak on, 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 on hard or soft terms, the United States comparatively uh, more capable than, than others economically, militarily, technologically, uh, and in terms of, if you would like to put it, um, even though the values they don't promote what they say, but it's still the values that they have and they, they, they advocate or somehow propagate sometimes, they're comparatively a little bit attractive than, than the one which let's say exists in China or in Russia for that matter. So if you are taking this, so now comes in the issue, uh, the, 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 an event happens, that is what we call it, the COVID-19, Corona happened. Now how, uh, uh, the, so who should take care of this, this problem? Um, and you could see that there is, the, the, so I, if, I, if I go back a little bit, I leave China, I, li I, I leave Russia, I leave others, but I would just focus a little bit on the uh, US-China relationship. Uh, yes, China is uh, considered to be a challenger and China is now leading and China, you know, this is what we are reading in the newspaper and China is going to take over. And the next day that it is a, um, it is a kind of uh, uh, wrestling game in which that uh, the United States is going to be defeated the next day and the championship is going to be handed over to, to China. I think these are a little bit simplification that uh, most of the time we, we, we do. Yes, definitely. Uh, corona comes. Um, you you will see first there are there 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 some kind of missteps, if I put it this way. Um, there are mistakes by both China as well as the. But keeping in mind, uh, United States is in control and in a driving seat, and it is controlling the state institution. I mean, international system institutions, whereby China is struggling to penetrate even in, in, in W, um, what do you call it, World Trade Trade Organization, it took them such, so still China has yet to, to have this. But what China was doing in the beginning, hiding. China was hiding, no one knew about it. And finally, when they felt, and then what China did was it started to, to blame the, the, the United States for a military lab and things, you know. So I think the assumption was that probably it is something very, uh, limited temporary territorial and it may not be something which will be spreading to the wrist and therefore 
uh, we will just use this and that will give us a kind of credibility in the eyes of the international community. And they say that the US is now trying to destroy China. Uh, well, um, th this, is, this is one version, but it went out of control. And it is not only a, a Chinese problem, it was something that we just spread to the rest of the world. So what to do? And then uh, expected was that the United States should, should come in and should save in a way but you have, you have in the United States a president who is much more interested in his own business rather than in humanity and its own people and its own citizens. And even today, I mean, I mean until now, he's trying to open the market despite the fact that they need to be uh, protected. So he would like to promote his business. But uh, maybe if it would be another American president, probably as soon as they hear or maybe some intelligence for, uh, information comes to them, they might have rallied uh, the international community and somehow um, even engage China and others to come have a collective response. And that would have been an opportunity for this uh, leadership to become even, uh, even, uh, even stronger. So you will find China as well as you will find the, the United States. Both of them had missteps. But now uh, China had in the beginning, but later China came in and started to, to distribute the goodies and this and that to those people and you know give them the masks and those things. Now, um, yes, China is becoming a little bit popular, people are seeing, but does that mean that China is really taking over and defeating and in the wrestling game, another power and basically, um, uh, yeah, it, show, it, it shows that the, the China is, is getting stronger. China is influence is increasing, but would it really um, control the international system? Uh, this would all depend back to go that the, what the United States basically controls, would China take over and control those things? If not, would China be able to develop parallel institutions, which will be basically challenging economic, military, now what you have today, you are seeing the NATO, um, ministers yesterday were saying that NATO is uh, still relevant. So they would be talking about the relevancy of those type of institutions that um, still Afghanistan is not a secure place, still Iraq is not a secure place, still terrorism is an issue, it's still uh, um, Daesh is a, a problem. So it is just to ensure that it is justifying the existence of this type of institutions which are basically American dominated. I'm not saying Trump dominated, but I'm talking about American dominated. Now, uh, uh, Trump does a lot of damage to, to, to this. Um, uh, what, what, so you will, you will find the, 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 the clash between the China and the United States on that level where both of them have difficulties, but the leadership is in the hands of the, and China is getting influ get better, get greater influence, but um, it, it looks like is not capable to penetrate into the system. Um, and it is not capable to basically, to re even, even those people who have received help from China. Um, and still, if you offer them the, the, the option between the American system, what America would give them and what China would give them, uh, I think um, even the Pew um, polling survey, opinion poll, others, they show that still they would, they would go for the American system because at least there's a little bit of transparency, relax, it is not such con controlled. And so you have, you, have, uh, you have this kind of system. Now, um, what the, 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 the American um, rebound uh, to rebuild back the system, I would say uh, it would depend on who will be in, 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 in next year at the, by the end of the year in the White House, uh, who would be? If it is Trump, I think damage will be done more. But I would say even if, let's say, if it, Trump's would be, it will be Trump's second term and it will be any other Republican instead of Democrat, um, he, they would be different from what Trump is doing because those are the ones that would come in, they would have American interests at, le at least, but not their own personal business interest in, 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 the, in, the, in the picture. So it, it, very, it will very much depend on um, uh, who the, the American would be. But I think gradually it, things will move. move. Maybe um, I will add a few, uh, two, three more. Now- Maybe I, we can saying, jump continue at Q&A session if you like. Just give me another two minutes. I will okay. just get back because this is something now. Uh, whatever it is will be the scenario. I would still say the United States will be in control, but then China is becoming more influence, uh, influential. Uh, in the system, 
but um, it, it, it will take time. It will take for the elephant is dead, probably, if you say, but even to bury an elephant, it will take time. You know, because it's huge. It's not a chicken that you can easily bury it, or it's not a cat, something that you can just. Now, what happens is, this Cronaut suggests to me this. Uh, I think, um, uh, uh, I think the um, another complex. We have this military-industrial complex, which took over after the war. You know, after the wars, and basically is dominating the uh, the the, the uh, foreign policies. But I think the great power relationship will be greatly influenced by the R&D in the pharmaceutical and in the healthcare system. So I would call it that our pharmaceutical industrial complexes in, 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 in the making, where all governments will be, uh, will be pouring money into, into drug related uh, issues. And um, they would be basically used um, maybe for whatever purpose in terms of sale, in terms of other things. And uh, you wouldn't know, even I, sometimes I do suspect that why Bush and others were basically promoting this because there were people who were advising them that this is a big industry that you can go in. But had it not been maybe terrorism and other things would distracted them, the Fauci and other things opinion would have probably materialized. And maybe they say, oh, we have succeeded to create vaccine and others, but actually it is a big business. So what will happen is that this will be, um, the healthcare system will, will go to the hands of these big, big businesses. And that is going to cascade down and will affect individuals in every state. So uh, therefore, um, if you would like to go and have uh, maybe a driving license, have you had your this chick or that chick? Uh, and you have to pay for this because there will be a lot of businesses will be working for this. So you will have, uh, I, I would say there will be a very strong industrial, uh, what do you call it, pharmaceutical industrial complex uh, will, 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 uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be emerging. Um, Thank you. And the last point is that I think uh, the coronavirus tracking system and, and tracing of uh, the, uh, the individuals that who have been meeting and do, do those things, it is giving the states a greater control over the freedoms and movements of individuals. And the great powers in relationship with the center in the periphery, in the peripheral countries, would be able to use these states uh, to track down all types of people that would they feel that whether economically or they are in some way, you know, the businesses that who will challenge and threaten them, they will bring them under different names and um, uh, try to uh, to track them. So, um, in a way, um, these were just a few speculations that I had, but these are nothing. In a way, I would say it's uh, very much based on um, proper research. So it would require more research to really verify these things or how it would happen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bob Nujam. Um, there are many questions uh, coming from our participants, those who listened to your talks. Um, so um, I don't know whether we will have time to address these all uh, because it's already um, 10 past 10. So um, what I will do is I will try to read the questions quickly and I will try to mention to whom it is directed if it is written in the question. And then we'll do a second round of just answers. But uh, my uh, kindly request is please try to keep your answers as brief as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, let me start, I'm reading a few questions. One of the questions is from um, Ennis. Um, he is asking that, um, you know, given Daran Ajemolu's argument that institutions are instrumental in creating inclusive political and systems and institutions, um, is there a likely scenario to have rise in exclusive institutions? And specifically, he means that uh, as after the Great Depression, we saw the rise of fascism, Nazism in Europe. Um, should we expect to see something like this after? Because um, I think many of the economists expect an economic recession in the next two, three quarters of the year. So um, should we expect the rise of such uh, 
new institutions or ideologies. Um, another question is from uh, Nejem. Um, he asks, um, so uh, there's an exacerbation of inequality and unbalanced power relations. Will there be, I mean, the result of the pandemic will be a rise of inequality or a more equal and harmonious world? Talha Hocam answered this question a little bit and he said there will be an increase in unbalance, but if anyone would like to comment on this, you are more than welcome. Um, Lina has two questions. One is about, to Hiba Hocam specifically. Uh, so she says, we have seen uh, with state capacity fading in the pandemic, some ma mafia or big drug dealers stepping in to win the poor people, distributing aid for them. So what are the dim dimensions and repercussions of such a phenomenon? Um, and uh, the second question of Lina is to Eric Hocam. Uh, so in the epicenters of the pandemic, she says, we witnessed and heard stories about how the choice was made about who to live and who to die. Unfortunately, in some regions, it was made based on the productivity. Uh, so save the younger and kill the older. Still, the productivity is the engine. And in times like these, it, it doesn't make sense that much. So will this be stronger, our focus on productivity or our, our culture of productivity or, my, uh, or is it going to change? Do you have any expectations regarding to this? Um, last few questions I would like to read. Um, there is one question from Önder Hocam. Uh, Önder Hoca asks to Hiba Hoca, uh, Hiba Hoca, how would you reflect upon the tension between ecosphere and the econ sphere, economics, I guess, under the tutelage of virus sphere. So how should we arrange our housekeeping relations after the virus? Um, I think this is more a, like an article. We need to write an article about an answer, but I believe in your capacity to answer in a few uh, sentences. Another question um, from Safa, she says, um, she makes reference to Foucauldian and Agamben, Agamben's understanding of state of exception and how states use these states of exception to create situations in their favor. So the question is, how should we understand in what way the governments may continue to take advantage of this ability to use the power after uh, the pandemic? Um, a question from Moaz to Talha specifically, what is the Turkish view or Turkey's view after Corona, especially after President Erdogan's statement that the world will not be the same as before. So does Turkey have a view on the world, uh, an official view maybe? Um, another question from Rami, can we say that the health system will become part of the national security system in each state in the future? So it's uh, again related with the war on terror probably. And there are some more uh, questions. And, and last one, I, I will read the last one from Risky. Um, so the question is, we talk a lot about the connection between the pandemic and society. Uh, the liberal values are declining, etc. Uh, but looking at the responses of some countries, especially in Europe, despite that they are part of the European integration, European Union, there is no help and solidarity on the surface. So is it even likely that after the crisis, states will realize the ineffectiveness of integration and be most, more self-centered. So maybe it can be related to our discussion on globalization. Um, although Eric Hocam talked more about the history, so can we make a prediction about European integration as well or anybody uh, from the panelists? So there are some, may, many other questions, but um, we don't have that time. So I would like to, start with Talha Hocam first, the questions you would like to answer, but um, if we can keep like three minutes, okay, I will be very uh, happy. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, short. I mean, Turkey's view uh, is very clear. From the beginning, uh, taking necessary measures and trying to convince society uh, was actually the do uh, dominant domestic perspective. Whereas internationally, uh, providing uh, support, uh, increasing the solidarity and cooperation 
especially with allies and with the you know countries we have ties was very important so i think this new idea of solidarity and trying to address the problems with cooperation and coordination was the ideal turkey tried to promote so turkey's capabilities are limited however uh, despite all these limitations turkey tried to promote this kind of help with the expect expectation that the other countries when they are in a better situation will also help the others so i think that was a clear message which found positive uh, also response from uh, world health organization and i think that's a kind of new world less competitive uh, we are all human beings and we have shared interests we have shared uh, i think uh, vulnerabilities and we have to address those with cooperation so that was the turkey's message and for the uh, i think this institutions and for the new shape of the politics i think uh, usually people uh, co you know uh, uh, try to make comparisons between the uh, the liberal politics and authoritarianism usually there's a binary opposition so they say that because the liberal uh, economies politics failed to address this problem uh, the authoritarian systems will be more popular in the coming uh, years the state will be strengthened i think I don't agree with this. I think there is a, a middle ground, which may be even as dangerous as, as the authoritarianism. There is an increasing the rise of uh, professionalization, uh, rise of uh, you know this uh, the oligarchies uh, that are controlling uh, societies. So uh, I think the uh, the the new uh, you know professional uh, groups uh, you know. Uh, elites especially were successful functional in uh, Korea Hong Kong uh, Japan so I think this uh, new uh, you know the rise of new exclusive uh, knowledge elites uh, may be predominant I mean I think the uh, the politics still is a uh, you know domain that ordinary people uh, may engage may have their influence may have their say either in liberal form or authoritarian uh, form. I think uh, this the increasing new knowledge competition, knowledge elite uh, may be also uh, a new trend, which, may, which will make this, uh, you know, uh, technocratic regimes more popular in the future, which may also uh, recreate uh, new groups, new societies in the future. So I think there may be more technocratic tendencies which may reduce uh, the domain uh, and autonomy of the politics. Uh, and I think the politicians and people may also respond to this, but in times of this kind of crisis, crisis and, think, uh, and in, the, in the period where we are heading towards a knowledge society, you know, competition over technology and knowledge, this may be the predominant theme and this will continue to, you know, uh, compete with liberals as well as authoritarians. I think that's a tendency and strong institutions may also help uh, their predomination in the system. I think this may be a challenging uh, task. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so I will go, order, oh, go uh, in the order of uh, the speakers. So next to Eric Hocam, would you like to comment on any of the questions? And you have uh, just three minutes, please. Okay. Yeah, there's a question from Lena about the role of economic rationality in, in a future society. <clears throat> Clearly in the US, there are people today who feel that we should sacrifice ourselves for the economy. And if old people die, that's okay, as long as the economy is uh, healthy and robust. Now, I think this highlights the issue of whether the economy works for us or whether we should work for the economy. And I think this discussion has been settled. I think the virus settled that discussion because it's no longer a matter of arguments and points of view. It's a matter of survival. And there's only one way to survive here. And that is that we help each other. And in, from that perspective, you know, economic rationality will not mean very much. And it's actually very interesting about the US. I mean, to people who, pursue this neoliberal individualistic uh, way of thinking in America could create real problems, wreak havoc. And uh, American 
have tremendous problems in the future. In a way, it's a question of listening to the virus, right? It's telling us something. And these are things that we know because we should know because it has been part of our own traditions. Our tradition knows about this already. So we, we need to return to that. And that's our only way to save ourselves. There's no individual individualistic solution, it seems to me. Um, yeah, Risky had just a question about the European Union. This is very problematic, of course, if the European Union breaks down and if people stop cooperating across borders. And this is not just a question of the European Union, it's a question of world politics in general. And for, for the same reason, really, I mean, it's not just that we have individual societies. Mankind, womankind, hu humankind, has also revealed itself to exist, right? It's in a way, it's like a sci-fi movie. We have this invasion of, of Martians, people coming from a different planet. There's a kind of being from a different planet and mankind, humankind, suddenly unites against this external threat. And we come together, we realize that we really are, you know, one. And, and, and if we don't realize that, it's, it's very problematic. Now, one smaller point, maybe, but very interesting, it seems to me, the, this obvious lack of leadership, and we're suffering greatly from, from this American indulgence to, to elect this person as uh, president. It's, it's a, bad enough if it hurts Americans, but now it's hurting all of us, and that's a disaster. But some people have stepped up, and it's really interesting to me that they tend to be women. In Germany, uh, Angela Merkel is doing a great job. In New Zealand, a, a, a journalist is doing a great job. In Taiwan, we have Tsai Ing-wen, um, female president, and she's doing an incredibly good job. And it's an interesting question, right? Why is it that women are better at dealing with this? Maybe women are more caring. Maybe men are more risk-taking. Uh, there's a risk-taker in the White House. There's another risk-taker in London, right? And these are dangerous people. It's interesting to compare, for example, with the uh, financial crisis 2008, when um, these young men were, were gambling uh, with our future um, and, and betting on, on uh, a roulette and, and losing, right? And the argument then was um, Christine Lagarde, who, who now is head of the European Central Bank, she made this argument that if women had been in charge in 2008, there would never have been an international financial crisis. And you can, it seems to me you can say the same thing now. So maybe that's a lesson for the future. Um, vote in more female leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric Kujam, uh, for the concise answer. So I will go with Nibajam um, right now. And again, just three minutes, please. Okay, I will do my best very hard. <laughs> Uh, first, I disagree regarding women's issue. I think that the system uh, were giving more attention to health care and had a, had a very strong uh, crisis management uh, groups and were very responsive to uh, the needs uh, of the pan uh, and to fight the pandemic at the beginning are the ones who want, and I don't think masculinity and femininity matters really, I think that uh, it's about uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, so. <clears throat> First of all, I want to just to, to uh, say something that might be framing my answers that I will go through uh, hopefully very quickly, which is that uh, I, I personally, because I'm not an international relations uh, 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 yeah, researcher uh, or academic, uh, I think that there is a lot of disorder innate in the system, and it's not a system. It's like the real, because I'm not fooled really by insisting on calling what we live in globally as a system. I think there are different systems and these systems enjoy a high degree of anarchy. And, uh, and yeah, this is a sub something that uh, even theories of international relations have been disagreeing uh, on. But uh, even if we agree to the notion of the system, then there are so many systems and it's very complex. So complexity is what we are describing. Uh, and I also think that because we are in, a, <clears throat> in an environment, cultural and academic environment that basically comes from a specific worldview, uh, which is not something that we should be ashamed of or anything, I mean, on the contrary. So I would like, I would like to introduce before we leave, if this is gonna be recorded, Yanni, for students to look at later, et cetera. Instead of the notion of the world order, I think that the virus should drive us to think again about the notion of Nizam al-Alam. 
the the world as an order you know so it's not the world order in terms of international relations and states but this the the, the order of the world as created so because the 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 imbalances imbalances in this order including the echo uh, sphere and the and the biosphere is actually uh, what what we are facing and pandemics just remind us you know we are facing problems all through but uh, pandemics are a good opportunity to revise this nizam al-alam and how do we look at this sort of order of the world in a way uh, including religion and and culture and other things that have no nothing to do with markets and and power and sovereignty um, I think that uh, uh, fascism, <clears throat> responding to one question, fascism will not find a good argument in the coming uh, months and years, and, and uh, the lockdown of the, uh, the shutdown of borders will not continue, simply because uh, so many experts who managed to help uh, European countries in facing the pandemic were actually from outside. Yani, uh, I heard, I'm not sure because the media cannot all the time be trusted, but one of the doctors who basically cured uh, who were working in the hospital uh, where Boris uh, Johnson uh, was hospitalized was an Egyptian. And we had uh, five uh, uh, Arabs, uh, senior doctors, who, uh, who, who, who passed away because they caught the, the pandemic while practicing their, their work. So I think that uh, also the news coming from Spain indicates that uh, because of the pandemic, there will be no possible uh, uh, move of the of the seasonal workers from North Africa to work in the agricultural uh, uh, sector in in Spain, and hence there is now a consideration that the Spaniards need actually to go to the fields and uh, pick their own crops because it's like nobody's there because the borders are closed. So it shows it will show that we cannot live actually separated from each other. There is such an interconnectedness, and it's not only on the very uh, worker label, uh, labor uh, level, but it's also on experts level. And the United States is just an example. We will not have fascism, but we will have <clears throat> by the state and by the regimes an attempt to create enemies. And it was very striking that in the middle of that, instead of just accusing, which is bad enough, just accusing China from afar that it contributed to this pandemic, the United States has announced that is basically accusing three Chinese researchers in the United States of being spies. So this is like a new McCarthyan wave as well. The Chinese will be considered to be enemies and they will be demonized inside the country, which was very striking. In the middle of everything, there came a, a person with a, an official statement. We arrested three researchers, Chinese researchers in the United States uh, and they, they claim that they were spies. So this is something that is, but, but massive fascism will face challenges because of, because of the complexity of the relations. Uh, regarding the, um, <clears throat> the mafias and how the mafias are trying to help poor families, etc. Uh, well, let's, let's remember that Bosnia, uh, in Bosnia, the first militias that started fighting against the Serbian uh, uh, attacks on different cities were basically the outlawed, the outlaws of these uh, cities because they were the ones who, who, who could, uh, could deal with guns. The others were civilians. They, they were tamed by the government and by the state and the only ones who could manage to fight and had uh, knew how to use arms were basically the thugs. So this was the first front of uh, the, 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 um, the um, the groups that basically started defending the, the, the cities and the villages in Bosnia. So good and evil um, uh, are, are a very long uh, issue, yeah, a very profound thing to think about. And I think that mafias also have, have their affiliation with local communities. And at, at time of, uh, of pandemic, they, they start working uh, on that. Uh, Ibn Khaldun reminds us all the time that human beings bounce between savagery and, and, and humanity. So it's like... Uh, this is, uh, this is for me very, uh, very normal. <clears throat> the question of Safa, the society, um, uh, how would the society react and would we face more and more a uh, curbing of the human uh, uh, element and agency in the public and social sphere? I think we will see uh, even more awareness of the importance of defending people's rights because the governments and the notion of the state is regarding protecting us from 
from the war of all against all, according to, uh, to Hobbes. And now if the governments cannot protect us and the viruses can come and kill us all, then there is a notion of social solidarity that will emerge, a notion of vulnerability and a sense of being that actually wants to reach out to people. And uh, it's very interesting that at the very moment where we are kept outside the public sphere because of health reasons, people are now, some of them are becoming more violent at home. So domestic violence is increasing in some uh, societies, but also at the same time, a lot of initiatives for home education, a lot of initiatives for counseling, a lot of initiatives for reaching out to people. I mean, for the first time in my family, they are making a family Zoom conference now to bring together everyone who is outside the country. Which uh, We always had the Zoom. We never thought about it. We, we were fine with the WhatsApp group, with, with all the family of all the gener of different generations is on the WhatsApp group, something like 45 people, you know, my cousins and, and the nephews and nieces, etc. And now they are calling today for a Zoom meeting, which is great. I mean, it's going to bring some people also together. So the situation is very complex. And complexity, again, is a word that I like to use. I will not say chaotic because chaos is where has a very bad reputation, but chaos is also about emerging new patterns of relations, of power relations, of social relations, and we are in the middle of that. And that's why I'm keeping a very close eye at how the states react. It's not about the the, the regime after World War One. It's about the Westphalian regime. And if it is now witnessing a substantial change, and we are in the middle of it, we will not be able to see it clearly till. It changes completely and we look back and see what happened. But in between, I think there is a lot that is being changed now. And we just have to look at the at the spheres that we, we give more attention than the common uh, power spheres only. OK, thank you very much, Bajam. And uh, last speaker uh, will be Wahabuddin Reis. Bahabit Najam, would you like to answer any of the questions yeah, within very just... Quickly. I think this yeah, very quickly, three minutes, yeah, please. Yeah, even I will maybe do the issue of equality. I think uh, we will be suffering from this problem of uh, inequality. Um, I don't see that there will be any attempt. Still, there will be individuals who would try to dominate and control and... Uh, benefit from the situations at, at the cost of others. So therefore, I, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent we might be basically moving towards a little bit of egalitarian lifestyle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So um, this will be the hour, end of the hour um, uh, program on um, world politics and coronavirus. I would like to thank all of our panelists uh, Dr. Talha Kyose, Eric Ringmar, okay. Ibarov, and Wahabuddin Reis. It was a very useful and insightful night for me. We tried to discuss uh, the current situation from different angles, from uh, political science, from international relations, political theory and philosophy, uh, from great power politics. We go back to history and try to predict the future. So it was full of uh, food for thought. Um, I would like to thank you for all, and I would like to thank our participants, uh, our uh, listeners who contributed to our discussions with their questions. I am sorry that I couldn't ask and direct all of your questions to our panelists, because um, I mean th there were many questions. I I tried to pick uh, some, um, and it has been like one and a half hour uh, program. So I would like to end the program here. And thank you very much uh, you. for your participation and contribution. Thank you, thank you, Enes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for it. Thank I miss you, you Enes. Good night. I miss thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.